privacy on BIM, E2E differential privacy solutions for Apache BIM uh, with Mirak Fuslat. So. Um, thanks, Maria. Uh, it's a nice coincidence that this was the one you wanted to see. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Mirak Fuslat Basharan, and I'm a software engineer in the Google Safety Engineering team. Sorry, Google Safety Engineering Center. Um, a little bit of background on the Google Safety Engineering Center. It's a global hub for privacy and security engineering located in Munich, Germany. It's where Google designs, builds, and tests uh, privacy features and technologies for users around the world, and in many cases, makes them available as open source projects. Differential privacy is one of such open source privacy preserving technologies. Today, I'll be talking about differential privacy and privacy on Beam, an end-to-end -end differential privacy framework from Google. The talk will be structured around answering what, why, and how questions. And by the end, uh, I hope you will be convinced that using differential privacy and privacy on Beam in your work is a good idea. Uh, during the presentation, please feel free to interrupt me and ask questions. We'll also have time for questions at the very end, if you prefer to ask them then. Um, all right, so in order to understand differential privacy, we need to understand anonymization. Let us consider an example. In Google Maps, you can know which hours are particularly busy for restaurants you want to go to or learn about popular dishes in this place. Of course, the data originally used for this might be very sensitive. We want to make sure we are not inadvertently disclosing data that could be used to re-identify re users or infor information about individuals. For one, location information used for restaurant business is inherently sensitive. This is the core issue of anonymization. How to publish useful data without leaking personal information. Anonymization allows to get valuable insights from the data, but uh, significantly reduce the liabilities and risks associated with the data. Arguably, anonymization can be even better since it removes the collection noise. Um, proper data anonymization can appear deceivingly simple. However, there are a lot of subtleties and hidden stones which can result into non-obvious ways of leaking sensitive information. The naive question is, why don't we just remove user identifiers? Removing identifiers might not be good enough, as well as removing PII, personally identifiable information. There are multiple well-known data breaches resulting from publishing de-identified data. One classical example involves a publication of de-identified medical records in the state of Washington. Those records could be partially joined with the voting registry using birthday and postcode. This was sufficient to identify a majority of the individuals in the dataset. In another classical example, as a part of competition in 2006 that is intended to improve the movie recommendation system, Netflix published movie ratings from its users. The records had the user identifiers removed, but researchers could partially join these records with IMDB database, which was tied to identity. Such a join made possible to partially tie the full history of movie rankings to the user identities. This is a classical example of joining the identified datasets and re-identifying some of the users. Finally, the identified search history can also, in certain cases, reveal the identity of the user. So there is a pattern here. Even if the records is published without direct identifying information, the content of these records, together with some auxiliary information, may make re-identification possible in certain cases. Thus, we need something better than the identification in general. The second question is, why don't we aggregate the data? In fact, it's a very well-known technique to publish aggregated statistics within buckets of users. Usually, this involves grouping by a set of features, for example, grouping restaurant visits by location and hour. This is commonly referred as k-anonymity, since each user in the anonymized dataset 
is indistinguishable from at least k other users. Canonymity provides stronger guarantees than simple data identification, but it's not perfect either. For example, it's problematic if I am part of a bucket that is associated with a sensitive attribute, say a particular medical condition. It's not helpful that I am indistinguishable from k other users having the same condition. While I cannot be associated with any particular record in the database, my sensitive attribute in that example is revealed. Another example, imagine two aggregate buckets, 99 users plus me and 99 users without me. Publishing aggregate info about those two buckets is canonymous, but it is possible to identify me and my sensitive attributes by differencing those two buckets. At last, if the attacker can modify the database and create fake entries, there is no anonymity for my data if I'm a part of a crowd of 99 fake users. Those types of attacks aren't always feasible or relevant, but they cannot be excluded in general. Is there a better way to define anonymity? That's when differential privacy comes into the picture. Differential privacy is a mathematically rigorous way to define anonymity. It is a mathematical notion that captures a very simple intuition. Suppose that you have some data, which you then use to produce a nice, useful result. Now, suppose that you use the same method, except you removed one of those users. Differential privacy tells you that the results should be essentially the same. If you only look at the results, you can't notice that someone has been added or removed. This tells you that the result did not contain information specific to this particular user. Each individual is protected. This definition makes intuitive sense. If my particular contribution doesn't affect the result, I want my me being present in the database. Um, to recap, an algorithm is differentially private if its output doesn't change much when a single person is added to the database. This has a rigorous mathematical definition, which basically considers a pair of two neighboring databases, calculates output of those databases, and remember, output is probabilistic. It defines the threshold of the probable density functions. This threshold that defines how much the output is allowed to change is called epsilon. Here's an example to give a bit of intuition on the previous definition. Imagine that we have anonymous statistics about number of participants of an imaginary conference by country. When we add one more participant, we clearly see the effect of this in the histogram. Furthermore, we know that the newly added participant is French. Thus, the statistics isn't differentially private. Once we added a bit of noise, the country of the newly added participant isn't obvious at all. In fact, we are not sure if anyone was added at all, which is the goal of differential privacy. Note that statistics is still valuable and legit, even though it's not perfectly accurate. We can add even more noise and make this even more private at the cost of accuracy. Note that extra privacy might come at the cost of utility. So differential privacy has tons of advantages. First, it's conceptually not very difficult. To obtain differential privacy in practice, you add noise to data. This noise has to be carefully, carefully calibrated. You have to balance privacy. You want each user to be well hidden and utility. You don't want the noise to drown out the real trends. Second, it does not rely on the privacy by obscurity and time pattern. The algorithms used are not secret. And finally, it gives strong mathematical guarantees with very nice properties. Resistance to auxiliary knowledge, that means data is protected even in the presence of auxiliary data. And composition, you can use it multiple times and you still get protection. Um, so I hope this convinces you that using differential privacy is a good idea in general. So that brings us to privacy on B. 
What is privacy on Beam exactly? It is an end-to-end -end differential privacy solution built on Apache Beam, and it is currently available in Go. In the future, we hope to offer it in Python as well. And for those who are not familiar, Apache Beam is a distributed data processing framework for working on huge amounts of data. It works very similarly to the MapReduce model. So using privacy on Beam, you could do differentially private computations on large amounts of data. Um, in addition to being able to work with large amounts of data, privacy on Beam is also out of the box. It takes care of all the steps necessary for differential privacy. So no differential privacy expertise is needed. But uh, why use privacy on Beam? Why not roll your own implementation? For example, you might be tempted to just add noise manually. The short answer is because differential privacy is hard. Similar to cryptography, there are a lot of implementation subtleties. So the don't roll your own motto applies. But if you need more convincing, I will try to demonstrate some of these subtleties and challenges in the following slides. First and foremost, differential privacy requ requires noise addition. However, noise has to be carefully calibrated. Do you remember that conference example from before? We need to add enough noise to hide the existence of a participant, calibrated according to the privacy parameters, as well as how much we expect participants to contribute to the output. Additionally, due to, the due to the limitations of floating point arithmetic in computing, there could be privacy vulnerabilities. For example, there was an attack developed by Ilya Mironov that leveraged least significant bits in sampling noise distributions to break differential privacy guarantees. So the noise generation for differential privacy needs to address such vulnerabilities. Finally, there is the concept of privacy budgets. When you do multiple differentially private computations on the same data, you have to, again, calibrate the noise carefully in order not to degrade your privacy guarantees. And this is usually uh, the case in practice. You're, you are usually interested in computing multiple statistics from the uh, same set of data. Another important step in differential privacy is contribution bounding. Let me try to demonstrate with an example. Imagine you are computing average salary of a group of people. Here, you can see the individuals with their salaries on the graph. They seem to have similar salaries in the range of 15 to $50,000. Do you remember the main idea behind differential privacy? We want to be able to hide the existence of a single individual in the data set. So the noise added needs to be scaled according to how much an individual can change the output, which in this case is the average. Only then we can hide the existence of an individual in the output. But what if there was a CEO in the group? The CEO, Emma, will perhaps have five times as much salary as the others, maybe even more. And our previous assumption about how much an individual changes the output won't hold. Someone looking at the average will be able to tell if the CEO was in the database or not, in the data set or not. So we need to enforce a bound on how much an individual is allowed to contribute to the output and then calibrate the noise we add according to those bounds. For example, we can set a lower and upper bound on the salaries like this. We can say that an individual is allowed to have a salary between $20,000 and $100,000. If an individual has a salary lower than 20,000, we would consider them as having a salary of 20,000. And if they have a salary higher than 
100,000, you will consider them as having a salary of 100,000. So in this particular example, salaries of Tom, the lowest, and Emma, the highest, would be clamped. There are cases where even the existence of categories in your statistics is sensitive. In particular, when the output categories depend on the data itself, one should be careful when releasing them. Consider the conference example again. Here, we counted the number of participants per country, right? And then we added enough noise to hide the fact that someone was added to the database and that the newly added participant was French. Now, what if the newly added participant was from a country not listed on the graph? For example, what if the newly added participant was Turkish? Now, the categories outputted by the process changed. Even if we add noise to the output, the simple fact that we have a new category now, Turkey, is enough for an attacker to understand that the newly added participant is Turkish. That's the problem. You need to use complicated math to know when it is safe to release a category and do so only when it is safe. Obviously, this being a conference for open source software, I'm sure you're all well aware of advantages of open sourcing. So I'm not going to go through them. Similar to security, however, I believe it is even more important for privacy code to be open sourced. That way, there will be more eyes looking at the code, checking for bugs, verifying correctness, etc. That means privacy bugs will be less likely to occur and when they do occur, it will be easier to catch them and fix them. Now, I would like to talk a bit about how we went about developing privacy on Beam and some of our guiding principles. First of these principles is having an intuitive API. We wanted to have the privacy on Beam API as close as possible to the Apache Beam API to make it seamless for Beam developers to make the switch from a non-differentially private pipeline to a differentially private pipeline. Here, you can see examples of how we tried to accomplish this. For example, regular Apache Beam has P collections, large collections of data. If you want to do a map operation on the elements of a P collection in Apache Beam, you would call beam.pardo, parallel do with the P collection call as the input. If you want to count the occurrence of each value, you would call stats.count with the P collection call as the input. What about privacy on Beam? Privacy on Beam, or PBeam for short, on the other hand, has private P collections. If you want to do a map operation, on private P collection, you would call pbeam.pardo instead of beam.pardo. With the private P collection, P call as the input. If you want to count the occurrence of each values, you would call pbeam.count with the private P collection, P call as the input. Intuitive, right? We chose to put simplicity over completeness in developing privacy on B. Differential privacy is an area of active research and development, and novel techniques for solving different problems come out every day. However, it would be unmaintainable to try to support all types of algorithms, techniques, or noise mechanisms to try to address all possible problems. Instead, we decided to focus on more generic solutions and algorithms that are easy to understand to address more common problems people might come across. That way, we can have better maintenance and testing for the code that we do support. 
testing is always important in software development, but maybe more so in privacy sensitive code. So testing has always been a pr top priority in developing privacy on Beam. We have extensive unit test and end-to-end -end test coverage for privacy on Beam. Additionally, we have stochastic tests to verify that the mathematical guarantees for differential privacy hold in our implementation. This serves as an additional layer of protection against privacy bugs. So hopefully by now, I managed to convince you that using privacy on Beam is a good idea. I now would like to walk you through part of a code lab we have for privacy on Beam to briefly demo how you can use privacy on Beam in your pipelines. We won't have time to go through the whole thing, but if you'd like, you could watch the recording with this link on the screen here, or go through the material on your own. Now, I will switch to the code lab tab. I believe you can see it, yes. So imagine you're a restaurant owner and you would like to share some statistics about your restaurant, such as disclosing popular visit times. Now, thankfully, you know about differential privacy and anonymization, so you want to do this in a way that does not leak information about any individual visitors. Let's say you have this data set of your visitors. You have a visitor ID, for each visitor, you have time entered. So when they entered the restaurant, how much time they spent in the restaurant and how, many, how much money they spent. For this example, we are just interested in computing visits per hour. So let's talk to the non-private pipeline, non-private uh, version. So in Beam, you would have a function, count visits per hour, um, exactly, that URL is the one with the recording, but I think it should also have, um, maybe I can share this link. Yes, that's the URL for the recording, and this is the URL for the, the, the material on the screen here. Um, right, so we have this count visits per hour function. It takes in some beam scope, not very important. It takes in as input as a P collection, right? I mentioned P collections before. This is the collection of visits, right? It holds this data. Now, uh, what this does is from this P collection, it extracts the visit hour for each entry, for each row. So this is a very simple function. It takes as input a visit, a struct, and it returns the hour entered. So that's our visit hours collection. And then we use the beam standard function stats.count with the input visit hours to count visits per hour, and then we just return it. Now, if you, if you download privacy on beam and run this command, you will get this bar chart. Right, so you see that the lunchtime is busy, dinner is even busier at the restaurant, and other hours are not so busy. And I guess the restaurant start, like opens at nine and closes at uh, nine in the evening. Now, if we now let's uh, convert this non-private bar chart to a private one. In order to do that, in order to use privacy on Beam you need to create first a privacy spec. This privacy spec holds epsilon and delta. These are privacy parameters. I think we mentioned epsilon on the, on the slides before. And then using this privacy spec, you call the pbeams make private from struct function. You input it the, the p collection you have, your visits, and then the privacy spec, and then you enter you you enter as input the user ID field. 
This in case in this case it was visitor ID. This is our user identifiers. Now you have a private P collection here, P call. After that, instead of calling stats.count, we will call pbeam.count. And pbeam.count additionally takes as parameters these count params. These are some parameters related to differential privacy. For example, for count, this is max partitions contributed and max value. So for max partitions contributed, we set this to one. This means each individual can contribute to one partition in the output. So in this particular example, that means visitors can visit the restaurant once a day. So one hour a day, right? So our hours here are partitions. If they contribute more than once, so if they visit the restaurant both at 14 and 16, we discard one of those contributions. Then we set the max value field. So this max value is how much an individual can contribute within a partition. So that means when we set this to one, visitors can visit the restaurant once within an hour. So if for some reason they visit the restaurant at 40 and then again on 14.30, right, 30 minutes later, we consider that as a single visit. We discard one of these visits. In the end, your pipeline will look like this. We have the privacy spec and uh, private P collection creation. And then instead of stats.count, we have pbeam.count with some additional parameters. But everything else is pretty much the same. And this produce is a, a differentially private bar chart. And you, you can see on this chart the difference between the private version on orange and the raw version, non-private version in blue. And you can see it's actually quite similar to the non-private one, right? The private one has a little bit of noise added, but you can clearly see the trends. Right? You can see that the lunch is busy and again, dinner is busy and the other hours not so busy. So congrats, this was the first part of the code lab. Uh, we don't really have time to go through the rest, but if you are interested on learning more and using privacy on Beam in your work, you can go through the rest of the code lab to, exp to uh, understand how to use other types of aggregations and what these parameters and more mean. All right, now back to the presentation again. All right. Um, as I briefly mentioned before, one exciting development we have in the pipeline is about Python and other data processing frameworks. We are currently collaborating with OpenMind and open source community around privacy preserving technologies on implementing privacy on Beam in Python. It is still in early stages, but we have many volunteers working on this project. Furthermore, with the Python version, we aim to have a design and implementation that is not limited to Apache Beam. We plan to have the implementation to be easily extended to implement differential privacy libraries for other uh, data processing or pipeline frameworks as well, such as Apache Spark or Apache Flink. I believe that might be of interest to the audience here. We are actually looking for alpha clients to test out the Python version. So if you are interested, feel free to reach out to us. And speaking of reaching out, if you'd like to hear more about updates on privacy on Beam, along with other differential privacy projects, you could join the group here. In this group, BP open source users, we will publish our newsletter and send out announcements. You can also use it as a public forum and ask questions about our libraries and tools. So I recommend subscribing to it. If instead you wish to con contact us privately, say if you want to ask questions or provide feedback privately, you could send an email to dpopensource at Google. 
We are also curious about how people use our libraries and why. As you can imagine, it really motivates us to put more effort into open sourcing when we see people putting our work to good use. So we would appreciate it if you could let us know if and how you use our libraries. This information is also listed on our GitHub page, if you're interested. And of course, this being an open source project, we are very much looking forward to your contributions as well. If you wish to contribute, you could contact us first or directly take on the existing issues on GitHub. For example, you could be involved in implementing privacy on Beam in Python or other languages. We would really appreciate that. Or you could take on more researchy, exploratory tasks in differential privacy, if that is something you're interested in. <laughs> yes, always thank your free open source software developer. Uh, thank you for your attention, because I know that was a lot to digest. We learned about differential privacy, privacy on Beam, lots of stuff. And if you have any questions, I am happy to answer. I, I have to say I find it very refreshing to talk about this because we usually talk about moving data from one place to another, conflating data, doing things with data, but we don't really talk about, hey, I cannot really move all this data or conflate all this data without first anonymizing it. And it's very refreshing to, to hear about it. Yes, I um, totally agree. This is very important stuff. And we have a question. So how autonomous is this? Do I need to supply and maintain a set of parameters to maintain privacy? Um, so there is a bit of manual work involved. So I think you can steal my slides. So this all the way back, we had the epsilon and delta. Uh, yes, right, we have epsilon. And Delta is the more advanced version, as is in the more advanced version. Um, these are basically your privacy parameters. They quantify how much privacy you are leaking or how much, if you're looking at it that way, how much privacy you are protecting or how much an attacker can learn about the, uh, about the individuals in your data set. And there's a ton of literature on what's a good epsilon, what's a good Delta, how you should choose those parameters. And basically, after you chose them and learn how to use privacy on Beam properly by going through the code lab, reading documentation, and you should be OK in general that your pipeline and your output is differentially private. And you don't need to change those parameters later on, if you, even if you change your data set or pipeline, et cetera. So, if you don't change the parameters, is not that something that can be used to uh, reverse engineer the data sets after processing several data sets? Uh, thankfully, it's not. So I think that was one of the advantages of differential privacy I mentioned here. Hmm. It does not rely on privacy by obscurity. Right? It does not rely on your parameters or your algorithm being secret. So you can, if you want, you can publish your algorithm, your parameters, and again, you still get the same amount of uh, privacy. And this, this actually, this amount of privacy is an is a worst case scenario. It assumes a lot of uh, additional information on the side of the attacker. And uh, I guess Google is using this for, as you said, Google Maps and other. Do you know if this is um, widely used by other companies or other entities? Um, I believe it's being more and more used re recently. For example, one very exciting and big use case is the US census. So US census is done every 10 years, right? They count like they, they um, output some demographics about the United States and this one, 2020, is using differential privacy. Uh, and I, I think that's really exciting. So it's also seeing use in, in the public, like the government, by the government. Um, also, this is being used in the healthcare, health space, because health information is very sensitive, right? We actually mm -hmm. had one uh, company, 
I don't remember the name exactly, that is using uh, our open source libraries and to produce uh, differentially, private, differentially private output from health data. That's true. And also, the, the I know that the European um, government or the European countries are very uh, strict with this kind of privacy and this kind of how you store the data. And I was curious if you know if they're using this or if they're using something else to anonymize the data. But yeah, I guess you, you don't know, maybe. <laughs> yeah, not sure what... European governments are doing exactly, but I'm. I think it's just being adapted more and more widely all around the world. And we have another question. So um, from Soran again, should I test computation on DPED data and raw data at the same time to maintain correctness? How likely is that the computation slips into wrong outputs if left unchecked? Um, so. That could happen, you know, like your computation. Well, wrong outputs is kind of subjective, right? It will it will be differentially private output if your data set changes or something changes, obviously. But let's say like maybe something about your data set changes if you have like a periodically running pipeline or something. And then the, maybe the parameters you are using don't really apply anymore. For example, that max value or max partitions contributed parameters. And maybe you can start to get worse uh, outputs, like less accurate outputs in the end. Um, so that is um, that is a possibility. Uh, so like having raw pipelines, non-DP pipelines and DP pipelines m might be a solution. But then again, like working with raw data, keeping raw data, keeping raw statistics, has its set of disadvantages as well, right? Because that is sensitive information, private information, if you have the raw statistics somewhere. Um, yeah, we, we actually have a tool, uh, for example, to choose those parameters and see like how it affects your accuracy. And we would like to also uh, publish it as open source at some point. And maybe that could help with choosing the right parameters and maintaining correctness without, you know, uh, keeping raw statistics, raw data yourself. Thank you. I, I hope we see you more in following ApacheCon and you yeah. explain more things because I like this. And of course, I like that uh, this is open source and this can be extended. And... Yes, exactly. Um, I'm also very excited about the Python work because I think that's also popular in the open source community. And also people like Python. Um, yes, and thank you for listening again. And if you have any questions later on, you can reach out to me either here or on social media or on one of our contact links on GitHub. Thank you for being here. Thanks.